I encourage each and every one of you to be taking out your Bibles and following along with me this morning to test the things I have to say to see that it be by the Word of God. I hope that we'll find it to be the truth that we'll take and apply in our everyday walks of life. We can leave here being better servants of God in the future than we have in the past. You know, the Bible talks on several occasions about the importance of being watchful. Uh, in, in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 13, Jesus is talking about the end of time, and he says there that they need to, to watch. He says it on three separate occasions. In the passage that was just read for us in 1 Peter chapter 5, and in verse 8, it said to be sober, be vigilant, or some translations say, be sober, be watchful, for your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking someone whom he may devour. And so we need to be watchful when it comes to watching out for temptation. And we need to be watchful when it comes to watching for, looking for uh, the return of the Son of Man, as Mark 13 would point out. But you know, there's some things that we need to watch when it comes to our everyday aspects of life. Some things we need to keep a careful eye on to make sure we're keeping it in check and being what we ought to be. I want you to think with me for the next few moments this morning about the idea of watch. And we're going to look at five things in scriptures, five things this morning in scriptures that the Bible would tell us we need to watch. Number one, we're going to be watchful. We need to be watching our words. We need to watch our words. The hardest thing for us to learn to control is to control our tongue. Go to James chapter three. James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, James is talking about the tongue. And he says, beginning at verse 1, to not let many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, that is in his words, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. So we've got to be careful because the hardest thing for us to learn to control is our tongue. That is for us to control what we're saying. And so we need to be, therefore we need to learn to be watchful about what we say. Be careful what we're saying. We need to make sure that we're saying the right things. We need to make sure we're not saying things that the Bible would forbid. You know, one reason I think, or the reason I think that the tongue is the hardest to, to control or to tame is because there are so many ways in which one can sin with the tongue. <coughs> Excuse me, I mean, you think about, it would be easy if you could say, well, we don't need to sin with the tongue by lying, and lying was the only sin that was of the tongue. Then it would be easy to tame, then it would be a lot easier to tame. Or if we said, well, we need to be careful what to say because we don't need to say angry words, and that's the only way to sin with the tongue, well, that'd be a lot easier to tame. But the reason the tongue is hard to control is because there are so many ways in which man can sin with the tongue. If your Bible still open to James 3, that should be James 3, 1 through 12, not James 1, James 3, 1 through 12. And he says here in James chapter 3, he talks about the fact that we should not be cursing our fellow man with our tongue and then turn around and try to bless God. Look at James 3 again. We already read 1 and 2. Pick up in verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, standing the whole body, setting on fire the course of life, the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now let's stop there for just a second. I think that the, the fire is the illustration used in Scripture of the tongue here in James 3, and it's a very fitting illustration because of the good and the bad use of fire. And that is, it, we're getting here closer. You wouldn't know it with the temperatures we've had the last few days, but we're getting closer to winter. We've had some colder days. And when it gets cold, you might have a stove or might have a wood-burning fireplace, and so you put a little bit of fire in there to heat the house. Or maybe you've gone camping and you set a campfire. 
You can use fire for a lot of good when it's contained properly. But as James points out, see how small, uh, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. You know, it, it, it seems like every time the summer rolls around, at least, or throughout most of the year, you, you turn on the news and there's some wildfire burning somewhere on the west coast out where there's forest and when there's deserts, and it's just it's just burning out there. A few years ago, Gatlinburg, Tennessee had some wildfires that went through and caused a lot of damage. And I was through there uh, less than six months after the fire. And you go through and there's buildings burned, there's trees down, the grass still looks burned in spots along the sides. And you just see all the devastation that a fire can cause when it's out of control. The tongue, uh, the fire is a fitting illustration for tongue because the tongue, as we'll see in a moment, can be used for good, much good. And the tongue, when it's out of control, can be used for much bad and can cause much damage. And so James says that the tongue is a fire. It's set on, it's set on fire by, the, uh, by hell. And so for every kind of beast picking up in verse 7 now, and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. So he says here's the tongue, which is like a fire. And he's already said it's, you, it's, it, it's hard to control. If you, if you are able to bridle or to, to not stumble in tongue, you're able to bridle your whole body. He points out in verse 7, every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And so James says here, your tongue is like a fire, and, 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 and you've got to be careful because like a fire, it can get out of control. And you've got to be careful because no man has ever perfectly tamed his tongue. Okay, no, nobody has come to the point, as he points out in verse 8, no human being can tame the tongue. You're never going to get to the point where you say, I've got that under control. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And then he says, for with it, we, we bless God, but we curse our fellow man made in the similitude of God. James chapter 1 and in verse 9. And so we've got to be careful that we're not using our tongue to try to, to, to curse our fellow man, to speak ill of our fellow man. Nor can we use our tongue for speaking idle or careless words, Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 36. We've got to be careful of the tongue because there's so many ways to sin of with it. We can curse our fellow man. We can use idle words or careless words. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Some translations say, for every idle word they speak. That is, here are people that are using a word, and, and, and maybe they're not thinking about the meaning behind what they're saying. Or maybe they're trying to, to not say something, and so instead they, use some, they throw something else out there instead of saying, I don't want to say this word over here, that would be wrong. So instead you take something else, and maybe we're trying to substitute for it, and instead we're just using idle words and we're just throwing them out there. We don't need to use idle words or careless words. Not only do we not need to use idle words or do we not need to curse our fellow men, we need to use no vain babblings. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We need to not speak vain, or some translations say irreverent babblings. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 16. But avoid irreverent babble. For it will lead to people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. This word irreverent, according to Laonida, the Greek word rendered irreverent or vain, means to pertaining to being profane in the sense of worldly or godly. Are we using, are, are, is our kind of language focused more on worldly? When he talks about the, the teachings of Hymenaeus and Philetus, they were trying to teach some things that weren't according to God. And so this is irreverent babble. Are we saying things that are that is irreverent? 
Not just in terms of maybe we're not speaking with reverence to God, but we're saying irreverent things and that we're trying to say something, maybe even teach something that's not according to God's will. It's worldly. It's not godly. We could use our tongue for for cor- or for cursing, forgive it for speaking idle words, for vain babblings. We could use our tongue for evil by saying c- corrupt words, according to Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That's Ephesians 4 and in verse 29. Verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 4, Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Are we saying crude things? Are we saying, are we saying, trying to make jokes that are not, that are not, uh, that are not proper? Are we talking with filthiness? Are we letting corrupt words come out of our mouth? Those are things that Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 are wrong. Not only that, Revelation 21, 8, uh, it's a list of those who will suffer the second death in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, and among them are all liars. So we need to make sure we're watching to make sure that we're not lying. We're telling no lies, because that's wrong according to the Scriptures. And these are just some ways in which we can sin with the tongue. We, time, we could go on for all, for all day about just the words we say. And how we need to be careful. But the point I want you to see is. We can sin in many ways with the tongue. That's why we have to watch it. But not only do we need to watch it. Because we can sin in many ways. We need to watch it. Because we need to be saying words that are fitly spoken. Words that are fitly spoken. According to Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken. Is like apples of gold. In settings of silver. I heard one person say at one point. That that he said that he had read that the. The the words fitly spoken is the right person saying the right thing in the right way at the right time. And and we've got to be careful in what we're saying. That what we're saying is the right thing. We need to be not just not saying things that are wrong, but maybe it's the thing most fitting the circumstance. Perhaps somebody else may be the better person to, to deliver this message, depending on what it is. And we need to make sure we're saying it at the right time. There may be a time that if we say something to someone, it might not go over very well. And that wouldn't be the fitting time. And then when we, so we need to make sure we're using the right, saying it at the right time. We need to make sure we're saying it in the right way. You've heard this before. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And so sometimes we got to be careful because we might be saying the right thing, but we might be saying it with the wrong attitude. I want, you, I want you to think about this situation for a second. We've been talking on Sunday evenings about uh, teaching those that are lost. I want you to think about two situations. I'm going to say the same, basically the same thing. But it's all, I want you to think about the difference in the attitude and how somebody responds. Say you're teaching somebody that's lost, and as you're talking to them, you say, well, do you know that if you don't repent, you're going to be lost and, and, and condemned to hell? That's probably not going to go over very well. Versus you might say the exact same thing and say, listen, you need to repent because if you don't repent and turn from your sins, you're going to be lost and spend eternity in hell. You just said basically the same thing. But the way in which we say things can uh, can make a difference. So it's not just what we say, it's how we say it. That's part of having words that are fitly spoken. Proverbs 25 and in verse 11. And lastly, we need to make sure that instead, that instead of having all these things we saw not to have, that we have words fitly spoken and a speech seasoned with salt. Colossians 4 and in verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. When we're dealing with someone, are we having a speech that is gracious, a speech seasoned with salt? Again, going back to our illustration, are we the kind of person that's going to gently tell somebody what they need to hear? Or are we going to be the person in their face trying to, to sort of force it down their throat? We need to make sure that we have, say, words fitly spoken and we have speech that is seasoned with salt. We need to make sure we don't have all those other things we saw, the lying, the corrupt words, the vain babblings, the idle words or careless words, and that we don't curse our fellow man. We need to be careful. We need to watch. We need to watch our words.
But not only do we need to watch our words, we need to watch our actions. It's not just what we say that we need to watch. We need to watch what we do. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, we will give an account for what we do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes by inspiration, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We need to make sure we're watching our actions, because we're going to give an account for the things that we have done. And So we need to make sure we're doing the right things, the proper things. That means, first and foremost, we're not doing the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5, beginning at verse 19, it said, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we've got to be careful in in what our actions are, that our actions are not these works of the flesh, these things that are condemned, these things that cause us to be lost. Don't be doing the things such as the sexual immoralities or the idolatries or the drunkenness uh, or or, or the envy or, or having envy or any of these things that are listed here. Make sure what you're doing is what God would have you do. Not doing those works of the flesh, but instead be doing good works. For we are His workmanship, Ephesians 2 and in verse 10, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're created for good works that we should walk in good works. So we need to watch our actions And make sure that we're not doing the things of the flesh, but instead these good works that God would have us to do. We're doing what God tells us we must do within His Word. We need to watch our words. We need to watch our actions. We need to watch our thoughts. When it comes to watching what we say and what we do, those things are are things that we're very well familiar with. And we're familiar with all of these. But we're very well aware, yes, I need to watch what I'm saying. I know James chapter 3 and these other passages. I need to watch what I'm doing. I know I need to be doing good works and not the works of the flesh. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves, we've got to be watching our thoughts and not just our words and our actions. You see, we're going to give an account for our thoughts. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. It's not just the things we say and the things we do. It's the things we think that we'll give an account for. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divisions of soul and spirit and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, we're going to give an account for the things that we think. It's not just the things that we do, but we're going to be, uh, we're going to have to give an account for the things that we, that we thought about. I want you to think about Romans chapter one for a minute. We looked at Galatians five and the workers of the flesh, but there are several passages in the New Testament that give sort of this laundry list of sins, if you will, this long list of here are things you cannot do. Galatians chapter 5, here are the works of the flesh, those who do them are lost. First Corinthians chapter 6, here are the things that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God if you do. Revelation 21, 8, here's those that have the second death. Well, Romans 1, 29 through 31, as Paul is dealing with the Gentiles, here's the things the Gentiles were engaged in. I want you to look at this list here. Romans chapter 1, 29 through 31. And I want you to look at this here. There are 10 or 11, depending on your translation. One is omitted in the uh, critical text. There are 10 or 11 sins listed that have to do with our thoughts. Look at Romans 1, beginning at verse 29. It'll be on the board before you. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Now I want you to look at this in here. Covetousness or malice or being full of envy or maliciousness or haters of God or being haughty, foolish or faithless or heartless or ruthless. Every one of those has to do with how you think. The New King James would word them a little bit differently in verse 31. And again, it has one that's in the majority that's not in the critical text. It says that you are undiscerning, untrustworthy, unforgive, or unloving, unforgiving. Another sin that is by how we think, which is the one omitted in the critical text, such as the ESV, and then the unmerciful. I want you to think about those lists of sins. Is one over here coveting? Well, covetousness is something that is in their mind. Or does somebody have malice towards someone? That's something that's in their mind. Now, there may be some ways in which that eventually shows itself, but that's beginning in the mind. Being full of envy. Somebody that hates God. Now, you may see that they hate God by their actions, but that begins in their mind. Or somebody that is haughty or proud is the New King James. Or somebody that's foolish. Or somebody that's faithless or heartless. Or again, that's unloving, without natural affection is what that means. Or somebody that's Ruthless, or again, unmerciful, as the New King James would put it. You, you may see some results of that, but that is also something that started with their thoughts, with how they were thinking. And what we need to realize is that just like this list of sins, right here, by the way, alongside things like murder and gossips and, and, and those that cause strife and those with deceit, alongside that list of sins, by the way, just three verses prior, alongside homosexuality, are listed 10 or 11, again, depending on your translation, sins in thought. We have to be careful how we're thinking because we can sin in thought and not just in action. We're not only to be careful what we're thinking because we can sin in thought, but we need to be careful what we're thinking because Jesus knows our thoughts. That's why we're ultimately going to give an account for our thoughts is because he knows our thoughts. When Jesus was in his earthly ministry in Luke 11, it said, but he, in Luke 11, knowing their thoughts, Mark 2 as well, uh, when he's sitting there and some are questioning him, uh, why does this man speak? They're questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, verse 8, Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus question within themselves. They weren't standing there looking at each other going, hey, he, he's, he, no, only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus happened over here. They were questioning thus within themselves, and Jesus knew what they were thinking. We're going to give an account for our thought. We're going to give an account for the things that we've done because we can sin in thought. And we've got to watch our thoughts because we need to realize Jesus knows our thoughts. Therefore, we must bring our thoughts into captivity. In Second Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, as the Apostle Paul says, talking about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, or they're not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Are we bringing every thought into captivity? Are we making sure that our thoughts are being reined in, just like we're making sure our actions are reined in or our words are reined in? Are we careful to make sure that we're thinking the right kinds of things? Are we focusing on bad things? What we need to realize is we've got to bring thoughts captive by focusing on the good things that Paul points out in Philippians chapter 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any, is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Is our thoughts focused on the right kinds of things? These, these true and honorable and just and pure things? Or are we thinking about the kinds of things of Romans chapter 1? The kinds of things that God would condemn? Well, how are our thoughts? Are we watching our thoughts? We better watch our thoughts because we're going to give an account not just for what we've done, 
And not just what we said. We're going to give an account for what we thought. We need to watch. Several things we need to watch. We need to watch our words, our actions, our thought. Number four, we need to watch our company. We need to watch our company. Those we associate with will influence us. Now, 1 Corinthians 15.33 is dealing with, in the, con uh, the context immediately around it, those that are teaching false doctrine on the resurrection. But the principle of 1 Corinthians 15.33 applies far beyond that. And that is, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. We've got to be careful who we associate with. In their case here, they were careful not to associate with those teaching this false doctrine on the resurrection. We need to be careful not to associate with those who, who are engaging in sin. We need to be careful not to engage in those who may draw us away because those we associate with will influence us. I want you to think about Amnon in 2 Samuel chapter 13. In 2 Samuel 13, 1 to 6, Amnon had a friend. It's a sad statement. That, that should be something good. Friends can be a good thing. We know that from other passages, such as the book of Ecclesiastes. Friends can be a good thing, but the wrong kind of friends are a bad thing. And in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 13, Amnon uh, loved his sister Tamar. He was tormenting himself uh, ill because of his sister. And so he's talking to his friend Jonadab, and the statement is made. Now Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. And then you read through the story, Amnon tells Jonadab how he feels about Tamar, and it's Jonadab who comes up with the, with the, with the plan that Amnon forced himself upon his sister. And Amnon does it because that was recommended by his friend. He was influenced by those he was around. Not only was Amnon, Peter was influenced by those in the courtyard around him. In Matthew 26, 69 through 75, as Peter was standing outside in the courtyard, now remember, this is the same Peter that just a few hours earlier, as they're gathered in the upper room, says, Listen, Lord, I'm ready not only uh, to, to go to prison, but I'm ready to die with you. They may be scattered, Lord, but not me. That same Peter, when in Matthew 26, 69 through 75, is in the courtyard, he went from being around the other apostles and those he knew would stand by him to being with those who were in opposition to Christ and then he denied the Lord three times because he was influenced by those who, was, who he was around. And so we've got to be careful. Solomon warned his son to watch his company. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie to, and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our house with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will have one person. Here's those that are saying, listen, come with us and do all these things you ought not be doing with us. My son, verse 15 of Proverbs 1, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. Solomon says, you want to keep yourself from being that kind of person? Then don't associate with those kind of people. That's what he told his son. My son, watch your company, he says to them. You see, what we need to realize is we're going to be influenced by those around us, and bad friends can be a snare to our soul. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor, give a, uh, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Those we associate with will impact us. That's told in verse 25 as well. Uh, you'll learn his ways. And then you set a snare for your soul. You're putting yourself in a situation that is avoidable. By putting yourself with those that we shouldn't be associating with. Those who are of the world. Those who could draw us away. We're putting ourselves in harm's way by doing that. So we've got to be careful about those who we associate with. Because they're going to impact us. And they can be a snare to our soul. Watch your company. We need to watch. We need to be watchful in many things. We need to watch our words, our actions, our thought, and our company. And finally, we have to watch our heart. All issues flow from the heart. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Or from it flow the issues of life. 
Ultimately, it all comes back to the heart. And so we can talk this morning about we need to be watching our words and we need to watch our actions and our thoughts and our company. We can talk about all these things we need to be watchful for in our life, but it's all going to come back to this. I can be focused on watching my words or my actions or my thoughts or my company and try to focus on those. But the easiest way to get all of those under control is to come down to this last point. And that is we have to watch our heart because all other problems can be dealt with and made easier if it comes back to having the right kind of heart. For example, if we're watching our heart, we're going to be watching our words. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We were there earlier. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, and then verse 34. We looked earlier at a few verses later, but verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so everything comes back to this idea of the heart. We need to be careful what we're saying. Well, what does it mean? Have the right kind of heart. What's coming in is what's going out. And if we're filling our mind, if we're filling our heart with wicked things, then soon we're going to be saying things that we ought not be saying. But if we're filling it with good things, then we're going to be saying what we ought to be. Not only that, if we begin to fill our heart with the wrong kinds of things, what's going to result eventually are the wrong kind of actions. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. We've got to watch our actions. Well, how do I watch my actions? How do I make sure that I'm not engaged in something over here that I'm not being engaged in? Well, we've got to do what Daniel does, who's watching his heart in Daniel chapter 1 and in verse 8. And Daniel didn't defile himself with the king's delicacies because he purposed in his heart. Why did Daniel not defile himself? Well, he was watching his actions, but he was watching his actions because he'd already purposed to watch his heart. And he knew not to defile himself with those kinds of things. Not only that, we need to make sure that we're, when we're watching our heart, we're ultimately watching our thoughts. In fact, the heart, the biblical heart, is our mind. And so when we're watching our heart, we're watching our thoughts. Matthew chapter 15, we'll look at Matthew 15 and in verse 19. Matthew 15, 19 will suffice for our point. We have Proverbs 23 as well, 7 on the board as well, but Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witnesses, and slander. So out of the heart come, and then he lists some actions that we shouldn't be partaking in, but out of it also comes evil thoughts. Again, what goes in is what comes out. So if we're filling our mind with wicked things, then our thoughts will be on wicked things. But if we're filling our mind with the good things, the Word of God, then what results is we're focusing on those good things as Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 8 would tell us. Watch your words. Watch your actions. Watch your thoughts. How do you do that? Do it with your heart. And then when you watch your heart, you also watch your company. Romans 12 and in verse 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. When we're around those who are engaged in sin and we're abhorring evil, we're going to try to hold fast to the what is good and look for those who do the kinds of things that we want to be doing instead of those who are doing wickedness. In fact, when we're watching our heart, we're going to be careful who we associate with because being around sin is going to torment us. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 8 it said, For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, talking about Lot, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And to watch our, our company, well, when we watch our heart, that's going to help us watch our company because we're going to be, not want to be around sin because the, seeing sin is going to torment our souls just like it did for righteous life. Watch our heart. From it flow the springs of life. All these other issues come back to watching our heart. And if we watch our heart, we'll take care of these. So therefore, watch. Watch every one of these. Because our adversary, the devil, is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking someone whom he may devour. And if we're not careful, if we're not watchful, then what we'll do is we'll find ourselves giving in to sin. We'll find ourselves doing the things that God would, would condemn. We need to watch. 
we could talk about many things this morning that we need to watch, but we've talked about just five. And that is, we've got to watch our words. The tongue is the hardest thing to control, and so we've got to be careful what we say. We've got to watch our actions. We're going to give an account for the things that we have done, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so we need to watch the things that we're doing and making sure it's good works and not works of the flesh. We need to watch our thoughts because we're going to give an account for what we thought. And so we've got to make sure that those we're thinking on good things and meditating on good things, not the bad. We've got to watch our company because those we associate with will impact us. And so we've got to be careful and make sure we're associating only with those who will influence us for good and not for evil. And finally, we watch our heart. Watching our heart will help fix these other problems if we have a problem with any of the others. Because from the heart flow the springs of life. And so we need to watch. We need to make sure that we're not giving in to sin, but instead be watchful of our words, our actions, our thoughts, our company, and our heart. And again, besides these other four things outside of the heart we talked about, when we take care of our heart, it'll help take care of other things. We need to watch as well. But it may be as we come to a close this morning that there is one or more present who may have never responded in obedience to the gospel. If you're here and you've heard the word of God and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you need to repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be buried in the waters of baptism to rise up and walk in the newness of life. Because you've got to do those things that he's told us to do. Because we're going to have to account for what we've done and also what we haven't done. And that is when he's told us to do something and we don't do it, we'll give an account for that. And so if you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel, then you need to respond in obedience to his word. But maybe you're here and you've done it, but you say, somewhere along the line, I've not been as watchful as I need to be, and maybe I've given in to sin. If it's a sin of a private nature, you can take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it's a sin of a public nature, you would desire the prayers of the congregation. And we'll gladly pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. But no matter what your need is, if you're here this morning and we can assist you in any way, would you not come forward us together we stand as we stand?